We're getting ready to um, start plenary session four, which is clinical trials and emerging treatments. We've got three talks for this session. The first one will be by Dr. Jerry Mendel. He is the principal investigator at the Center for Gene Therapy at Ch Nationwide Children's <laughs> Hospital, the Juanita R. Curran Endowed Chair in Pediatric Research and Professor of Pediatrics, Neurology, Pathology, and Physiology and Cell Biology at the Ohio State University College of Medicine in Columbus, Ohio. Dr. Mandel is going to talk about um, the SMA success story and lessons for future gene therapy treatments. Thank you again for having me and for, um, for recognition. Um, last night, I appreciate it very much. And I thought I would make this a little bit, um, let's say, a little bit of the story of how I got here to do exactly that, rescue the lives of infants and children. And um, this story goes back quite a long ways because when I was um, uh, finishing up my neurology residence, residency, there was only one way to get out of going to Vietnam, and believe me, that was something I tried very hard to do. And, and part of the reason um, I'm where I am today, and the story begins at the National Institutes of Health, one of the ways you could get out of Vietnam was going to the National Institutes of Health as a public health um, a fellow. And so this was the class that I attended to, but, but the most important thing about that was that the medical neurology branch was completely devoted to um, to uh, neuromuscular disease. And I don't have a pointer that I can reach to, but the second person on your, on your left there um, is, a, is W. King Engel. And he inherited the branch from Milton Shy. They, they were both pioneers in neuromuscular disease. And, um, and that is where I learned about both SMA and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There's several people in that picture who were sentimental to me, some of which have passed on, and fortunately, I've been very well, I've been very healthy most of my life. But I went there from, um, in, in early 1973, I started my position at Ohio State University and Children's Hospital. And that's about what I look like and about how confused I look. And, <laughs> and ask what should I do now. I, I brought these skills from NIH, but was very naive about implementing them. And the one thing that made a big difference in my life was something called, that we call the CIPD group, the Clinical Investigation of Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy. And this was a very intense group, one of the early ones who were involved in clinical trials and did uh, many of the, um, critical studies, including the major one in prednisone delivery for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And the principal players in that were Mike Brook is sitting down there, uh, Birch Griggs is over on my right there, I'm somewhere uh, about two people down from him, and Jerry Fenichel. That was the That was the group that was the CIDD group. And we did multiple clinical trials, really learned how to do clinical trials which had a great impact on my life. And I show this picture because one of the, one of the goals I had um, as, uh, as a uh, research investigator clinician, or what we call clinician scientist or translational scientist now, was to train people. And these are some of my proudest um, students or fellows. Uh, Matt Wicklin, you know, he's here. And I hope he's in the room here. If he is, I hope he can raise his hand. Um, Tony Amato, who's getting a, 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 a chair named after him at Harvard. And, and there I am in the middle. John Kissel, uh, again, made great impact on, on the SMA uh, gene therapy world. And Rick Barron, who um, ha all these people have made it up to chairs, deans, and every other thing, so it's a, it's a great legacy for me. So let's talk a little bit about, about viral delivery and just a little bit of the science part of this. 
one of the reasons for bringing this up um, is because how I landed in this field. There, was, there were no gene therapy trials with adeno-associated virus, a confusing term. AAV is a, is a very small virus. It's represented at the bottom. And right on top is adenovirus. Adenovirus was um, what most people use for gene transfer. But a great crisis happened with adenovirus. Right at the time I started my first gene therapy trial in 1999. And this was um, a trial that was, was done in a disease court called ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. And this patient had the, had the gene delivered with adenovirus, again, not adeno-associated virus. The names are similar for scientific reasons, but not so much relevant to the discussion today. But the patient died four days after the treatment, and this really put a hold on gene therapy for quite a while. And if you look at this next picture, what you'll see is actually a little bit of the history of gene therapy. In 1990, the FDA actually approved the first in-human gene therapy trial that was done with bone marrow um, stem cells, and it was for a, a severe combined immunodeficiency disease. So uh, the reason for showing this is just to show you what a short time gene therapy has really uh, been on the um, been on our in our vision and how much we've accomplished since that time. It was 1995 that the first gene therapy trial was actually successful. This was an article that was in Science Magazine on the same disease, severe combined immunodeficiency disease. And the reason um, I show this is these were, these were done not with, um, not with adeno-associated virus, I mean, yeah, not with AAV, but actually the first gene therapy trial that we attempted to do was um, with, with AAV in, in limb girdle muscular dystrophy, as I said last night. Um, and that was done on campus. I, I shared my experiences on campus, Ohio State University, with Children's Hospital. The Department of Pediatrics is at Children's Hospital, and sometimes we disconnect children's, nationwide children's, from Ohio State. But the, it is the Children's Hospital of Ohio State University. But shortly after we did two patients, and I'll come back to that, that's when the Jesse Gelsinger famous uh, trial with adenovirus took place and the patient died, and at that point all gene therapy stopped. And it, it took us four years to really get up and going again, great hiatus here. And so in 2004 I moved my whole operation down to Children's um, and actually met people like Louise Rodino Claypack um, in, in the experience of uh, down at Children's and, and other people have been very successful and established the gene therapy program at Children's. And between 2004 and 2017, when the, first, when the first product for gene therapy was approved for the clinical use using AAV, which was in 2017, we did between 2004 and you'll see in 2019, we did about eight gene therapy trials that brought us up to what we had in 2019, which was a successful gene therapy trial that was approved for clinical use in spinal muscular atrophy. So let's look at the story of that a little bit, but last night I mentioned, uh, the first person I met here last night as I walked in the door was Donovan Decker. And Donovan and I have known each other since that trial in 1999, so it's exactly 20 years. And, and uh, I'd say we're partners forever, and um, it's a great privilege to know him. So he was the first person ever to receive gene therapy with AAV, and the first person, and he was a limb girdle muscular dystrophy patient. So I think it's appropriate for this conference. So here's, here's the intravenous therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. And I have on the, on the slide that's rolling in there exactly the principles of gene therapy. You take the virus that we abbreviate AAV, you take out the, the genes from AAV, and you put in the SMA gene in this case. Then we have vector manufacturing, which makes millions of copies of AAV. 
and then we can take it to the patient's bedside and infuse it in a, an infusion pump. And this is actually the first baby we did with AAV. The virus numbers are on top, won't mean much to you, but two times 10 to the 14th virus per kilogram was the highest dose of virus that ever been given to a human. People were nervous about that everywhere. And I was reasonably confident that it would work, but you can never be overly confident about anything in clinical trials. But the reason I show this is to show how well it's tolerated. This baby didn't react at all, and that's pretty much the truth for all gene as it's delivered. So um, you'll see here, within nine weeks, we could see improvement like this. The baby on, babies on top are typical of SMA, have uh, virtually no, uh, no uh, muscle function. And within nine weeks, we can start seeing improvement of truncal function. Then we can see babies uh, sitting like this, and, um, and it becomes, you know, very, very gratifying to see and participate in a trial like this with good head control, good trunk control, and then a loving partner, as you see there. But let's not take away from this early walking. This is another stage in the development of gene therapy. We see now the baby uh, walking, and this is the first time that they could walk independently. And so, again, a huge milestone. And then we, we go through this, and now we see our American Ninja Warrior there who is do, who's breaking the bank and, and doing everything else and then going off to work, as you can see here. And then I have another picture of him in the beginning. But the reason I show this is this is the, now SMA has been approved by newborn screening, and we hope to accomplish that um, in, in the muscular dystrophies, because that really makes a profound difference. In Ohio and 10 other states, we have newborn screening approved for SMA. And this was the first baby who was identified in Ohio um, about about 100 miles north of us, and they came down to Children's Hospital, about the sweetest thing you've ever seen, and no clinical manifestations. And once we delivered the gene, she never had clinical manifestations. The real advantage of giving the gene at birth, and I want to do everything I can, and PPMD is working very hard on this to get uh, newborn screening approved for muscular dystrophy. And um, this is the child I showed you who's the American Ninja Warrior, and I just got this picture from his mom and asked him if I could show. This is four years later, exactly four years later, and the reason for showing this is one of the questions we get asked is how long is gene therapy going to persist? Do you really have to worry about it not expressing for a long period of time? And I think we have a winner here that will express indefinitely, and here, um, here are our little boy is going off to school. So again, a very gratifying result. And fortunately, we won the Scientific Breakthrough of the Year Award from Science Magazine for our publication of the SMA gene therapy trial in 2017. And one of the greatest gratifying moments I've had in my career is Francis Collins. You remember Francis Collins um, uh, did the, uh, performed the human genome uh, analysis and, uh, and broke the code for the entire human genome, and he's the director of the National Institutes of Health. So you can appreciate how humbling it was when he came to Children's Hospital to uh, extend his congratulations for this trial. So um, that is the story in SMA, and I'm glad to answer any questions, but we have looked like a winning and a safe product. Very few side effects. We've had a little bit of nausea and vomiting you, sometime in the first week after gene delivery, but not much, and no clinical manifestations, and some minor ele liver enzyme elevations. So I moved this trial then on to, I'd done many, many trials in Duchenne dystrophy, and I see Sharon Hesterly looking straight at me, because I've done some with her, and uh, we never had this kind of success, but. Finally, after 50 years, gene therapy seems to be making a difference for Duchenne dystrophy. And Louise will tell you about how it's doing in LGMD. 
But here's, here's AAV, and there are multiple serotypes in AAV. What does a serotype mean? That's AAV that you can see the picture of. That's the virus. And the serotype means that there are slightly different composition of amino acids in the, in the capsule of the virus, but really pretty minor. And it, it's isolated from a non-human primate. The reason we use RH74 at Children's Hospital is because it was isolated from at Children's Hospital. So there are 100 different serotypes, and most of them have been patented by other people. This one we can use without worrying about differences in IP claims that if you use this, you have to share revenue sharing and all these other things. So, um, and it has a relatively low pre-existing immunity. Pre-existing immunity is something that has to be checked. Um, there, everybody, there's probably about 80% of the adults in this room who've had, a, who've had exposure to some form of AAV, not, this, not the same ones, so it's, so it's selective for which form you've been exposed to. Say with RH74, it's a, an AAV9, which are the two products that we used in the trials I'm showing you, there's about somewhere around 10% of the population, maybe up to 13% who's been exposed, and less in children. So um, we have a chance of, of escaping any pre-existing immunity. That's similar to what you would get in an immunization for mumps, uh, chicken pox, measles, other things. So, but you have to be careful of that. Although we do have ways of getting around that that we've shown. So. Here's the picture of the microdystrophin. Why microdystrophin? Because that's the whole gene, if you look at it, or what we call the cDNA, the part of the gene that expresses. But it's very big. It's 14,000 uh, 14, base pairs. And AAV will only hold 5 kB. So that is um, the, the scaled-down version, the microdystrophin. You can see on top how big it is. And the one on the bottom is what, is what we uh, inject into patients. And the other thing that's very important about that is the MHCK7 promoter that enables robust gene expression. Robust meaning in this case it expresses in the heart and expresses in skeletal muscle. So that's certainly an advantage. And fortunately, working with Louise, she did a lot of the preclinical studies on this. Um, at, that have brought this to clinical trial. But these are the mouse studies that Louise did in her lab, and the MDX mouse, which is the common mouse that you use um, for Duchenne uh, preclinical trials. And if you just compare the top line and the bottom line, you see how much on the top line is normal and how much on the bottom line is what happens after you express the gene. So it's very robust in terms of what it can do, and the middle part is what the mouse has on its own without any gene expression. That's more or less what, L, what limb girdle patients have who are absent in sarcoglycan or other genes, and, um, and what Duchenne patients have when they're absent in microdystrophin or, or dystrophin. And the reason for showing this is just to give some appreciation. We're often asked, why, why do we use this particular cassette, as we call it, this particular makeup of the virus, that, of the gene that we're looking at. And it's been compared to other ones. The top line is the normal one there, and the second one is with, is with a microdystrophin. And what this is telling you is we do, these, we do these recurrent stimuli of the muscle, take individual muscle fibers, stimulate it, and see how resistant it is to losing force in the muscle. So over time, you, can, you, you, you look at can it retain its force with this microdystrophin. And the fact is it retain, retains it very well. And then when we inject it into patients, and I'm showing you the picture of the first four patients that we injected. The bottom line there needs almost no explanation. We have gene expression that's over 80% um, in, the, in the muscle of the Duchenne patients, the first four patients, we're now on to a trial where it's double-blind, controlled, randomized, and after these four, first four patients, we've injected another 24 and about to enroll another 20 more. So the trial is going very well, and this is um, another way of measuring 
dystrophin is called a western blot and the dark line there is what you see as very uh, very robust gene expression and depending on how you measure it it's over 75 percent uh, of the of the natural occurring uh, dystrophin gene so very robust and these are this was the first patient that I did and obviously I show this because it's really an atraumatic procedure. Gene delivery is almost anticlimactic. It goes so easily in, and it's, it's infused, and you can see the two IVs he's got in his hand. One we have with a, uh, with a saline injection, and the other is where we put the gene. Hardly a reaction at all from the child. And this shows with our very reliable physical therapist, there's Linda Lowe's who worked all day yesterday measuring limb girdle dystrophy. And on the left, you see before gene therapy, and on the right, you see how quickly he gets up 90 days after gene delivery. And here's uh, the first patient we did who never was able to ride a scooter and is now doing extremely well. And here he is running, playing soccer, and very another gratifying picture. On the left, you see walking up the stairs two days after gene delivery can hardly do it and then 60 days he's knocking it out of the park so again it looks very favorable and I love this picture because he shows that he can go upstairs with holding something in his hands and doing very well and these are the first four boys doing uh, doing different things I don't know how many of you can walk on a tandem gait like that, but certainly well beyond my skills. And um, jumping on a trampoline, running like that, um, all very gratifying. And the safety data is very good with, um, with this kind of approach. We've had elevated liver enzymes, which means that when we deliver the virus, whatever doesn't get in the muscle is cleared by the liver and sets up little pockets of inflammation. We haven't had um, any serious side effects from that. There are no clinical manifestations, although it is a little, it's, worry, it's worrying when you're on my side and you see the liver enzyme going up, but we can suppress those with prednisone. So I, I want to thank you for um, allowing me to talk here again today, and thanks to all the team just mentioning Louise and I have worked together for I think almost 15 years now. Zarif Shahank and I, she gets mad when I say we've worked together for 40 years. She doesn't like that. She's working on CalPain now um, and doing, uh, making that potentially available. And uh, the other group I'd like to point out are Linda Lowe's, Lindsay Alfano, Natalie Miller, and Megan Iamarino over on the right. There are physical therapists who've done, we couldn't do anything without them. Without them, there wouldn't be a clinical trial. So I'll stop there and thank you very much. I hope I didn't go over.